Our hero has made it onto Scaria. He's on this island far away. Uh, we start to learn now as he makes his uh, movement from this edges of the island where he meets Nausicaa and her friends. Uh, when he moves from there into the center of this town, uh, the city, uh, he sees uh, something really amazing. Uh, this place is uh, a little bit strange. It's not quite like a normal uh, citadel uh, that we will hear more about as Odysseus goes on on his adventures and we've seen uh, represented in Telemachus's journeys as he goes around and sees uh, Nestor's palace or Menelaus's palace. Uh, the Phaeacians have a slightly different uh, kind of reality that they live in. Uh, they are far away and they don't mix all that well with others, we're told. They're at the world's frontier out of all human contact, uh, we're told on page 174 at the bottom uh, in book 7. Uh, there's plenty of food there. The crops are irrigated by springs. There's a kind of natural irrigation system that's happening. Uh, there's gentle winds that bring ripeness in all seasons. Uh, so they have these lush, almost magical orchards that just uh, produce food. It just kind of comes up uh, out, of the, uh, out of the depths without uh, extra toil having to be uh, exerted in order to get the food, uh, to get the food out. Uh, we'll hear later at the close of book eight of their magic boats. Uh, they have boats that actually steer themselves. Uh, they don't have steersmen in their boats. Their boats just kind of know by will uh, where they're supposed to go. Um, and then maybe uh, uh, something to focus on in terms of the strangeness, strangest of all, is the idea that the gods talk to them face to face. We hear about this on page 186 uh, in book 7 that uh, the um, uh, Phaeacians uh, have ability to talk face to face to the gods. Usually uh, they don't disguise themselves when they come and talk to the Phaeacians. Now this is really weird. Uh, when humans have direct views of gods, usually there's trouble in mind. Uh, there's a story uh, of Zeus and Semele that some of you all will know, uh, that a, a, a young mortal girl who has a tryst with Zeus uh, convinces him to show uh, him to herself in all his full glory. And he says, no, please don't make me do that. And when he does, uh, she gets incinerated because of how amazingly glorious Zeus is. Um, similarly, we'll hear other kinds of stories of humans getting in trouble by getting too close to gods as the, uh, as the course uh, advances. Um, then also remember we made uh, a mention when we talked about the marriage of Peleus and Thetis, uh, that in an earlier mythic time, even you know, prior to myth, myth uh, in the beta stage, um, that there are some tales of uh, just kind of normal human god interactions. They went to parties together, they shared meals together. Uh, we hear about that in the marriage of Peleus and Thetis. Uh, later on, we're going to see a really interesting episode of this portrayed in Hesiod's Theogony. Uh, that's going to be the story of Prometheus, so you know that things get a little bit messy uh, when it comes to that interaction as well. Um, but for the, uh, the uh, Phaeacians, they seem to have this easy rapport with the god face to face. Uh, they live then in this uh, all, a mythic space that's already kind of mythic for myth. Uh, it's proto-mythic, it's beta myth, it's the early side of things. Um, so they have this uh, easy back and forth. They are though, while they're removed from others, they are though extraordinary sailors. Um, and this sailing capacity, this sailing prowess brings them what uh, sailing prowess always does, uh, extraordinarily rich trade and tremendous amounts of wealth. There are fabulous riches described uh, as Odysseus approaches uh, the, the palace of King Alcinous. Uh, there's amazing stuff that he runs into, a detail of description and a lavish description such as we have not yet seen. Um, this uh, scene where the, the, the wealth of the, of the palace is, is described uh, gives us a chance to talk about one of the uh, uh, common Homeric techniques of telling a story uh, that are really useful for us to focus on to get the most we can out of this myth. Um, uh, Homer uses a technique called ring composition. And in ring composition, some specific thing here, labeled A, uh, is articulated in the story. And then there's a long digression here represented with B, uh, where we talk about some uh, thing that is related to this specific, usually specific physical thing that we just ran into. Uh, and then we'll know that we're done with the digression when we mention A again. Uh, so sometimes he might say, you know, and then the general picked up that sword, that sword which was handed down many generations earlier to his grandfather and his grandfather and got passed down to him. 
that sword is the one he picked up now. So usually we will have a articulation of the physical object, we'll have a long digression, and then another articulation of the physical object to close off the ring. Um, thought to be a very useful aid for those that are doing uh, oral uh, formulaic uh, presentations of poetry. So if you're memorizing something and you're trying to get it going and then you want to talk about your digression and then you want to remind yourself and your audience that you're done with the digression, just mention the thing you did at the beginning. It tells you time to get out. Now, uh, this uh, technique is used in great effect uh, when Homer is describing the riches at the palace of King Alcinous. And let's just take uh, time to look at a little bit from Book 7 uh, using Fagel's in this translation. Now, as Odysseus approached Alcinous' famous house, a rush of feelings stirred within his heart, bringing him to a standstill, even before he crossed the bronze threshold. A strong radiant, a radiance strong as the moon or rising sun came flooding through the high roofed halls of generous King Alcinous. Walls plated in bronze, crowned with a circling frieze, glazed as blue as lapis, ran to the left and right, from outer gates to the deepest court recesses, and solid gold doors enclosed the palace. Um, pretty striking uh, description of what he's walking into. And in fact, the description goes on and lots of details are brought out. We hear about the threshold that he's standing on is actually itself made of bronze. Uh, the door posts and the lintel are made of silver. Uh, the handles on the door are made of gold. Uh, there are gold and silver dog statues on either side of the door that were made by Hephaestus himself. Uh, they're immortal and never die. They're guard dogs made of gold and silver. Um, there are many thrones in the palace. One is just not good enough and each of them is decorated and draped with beautiful fine fabric uh, that's uh, of extraordinarily fine quality. Then there are golden statues of boys that are there for torch holders. There are 50 servant women scurrying around and there are magnificent orchards and, and vineyards stretching for acres that uh, just fertilize themselves. So we hear this long, long digression on tales of the extraordinary wealth of Alcinous' palace that's visible uh, to Odysseus's eyes. At that point then, at the end of this digression, uh, bottom of page 183 and 84 in Fagels in the middle of book seven, such were the gifts, the glory showered down by the gods on King Alcinous's realm, and there Odysseus stood, gazing at all this bounty, a man who'd borne so much. Once he'd had his fill of marveling at it all, he crossed the threshold quickly, strode inside the palace. So with our ring composition, we have an A and a B and an A. The A is our threshold, and then the digression uh, in B is our long and detailed tales of wealth, and then A is again our threshold. Uh, the way that Homer uses this, uh, look at what he's done, uh, the usefulness of this ring composition, and it's, it's, it's characteristic of a Homeric technique. We have Odysseus enter into the palace, and we basically see it through his own eyes. Uh, he walks in, hits the threshold, and then he's just overwhelmed. And in that marvelous one or two seconds of Odysseus getting the visual, overwhelming uh, impression of wealth in Alcinous's palace, in that short time, Homer goes on and on and on in narrative description, and then reminds us at the end of it that actually what we've just done is paused with Odysseus for a moment on the threshold. But what we've been able to hear is this giant explosion in Odysseus's mind of, of, of deep uh, registering of this uh, powerful, uh, emotional um, kind of uh, 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 element, uh, elements of perception that Odysseus gets. So time is able to actually expand and explode inside of these rings. Uh, we'll have a mention of something, there may be a long memory that comes back to someone and then a mention of it at the end. That memory of course comes back in an instant, uh, but the representation of it in Homer's poetry goes on uh, for some lavish amount of time. So rings provide a way for Homer to uh, dilate on certain very pregnant scenes uh, to let us uh, pause for a moment, uh, usually inside of someone's head as something grand uh, happens right before our eyes. And in this case, there's nothing that's gonna be quite as grand uh, as Alcinous's palace, it's extraordinary. Um, so Odysseus is entering into a world of, of uh, tremendous, uh, tremendous wealth.